Hello, this is Mark Truly, editor of Providence, a journal of Christianity and American foreign policy with another episode of Marxism with fellow editors and fellow Marx, Mark Livecki and Mark Melton. We're reviewing several pieces from Providence this week, including a new book by a Mennonite author. We're looking at a piece on James Bond and why we need the Cold War or the new updated James Bond. And then finally, Mark Levecki will share about his piece that was not in Providence specifically, but in World Magazine about uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and whether he should have resigned over Afghanistan. But first, to the Mennonite book whose title is How to Have an Enemy, Righteous Anger and the Work of Peace by Melissa Flor Bixler, a Mennonite pastor in North Carolina, graduate of Duke Divinity School, former intern at IRD, uh, but uh, came from a traditional Anglican background and has shifted, I would say, theologically and politically in time for publication of her book, reviewed by our regular contributor, Deborah Erickson, in which she unveils, Melissa does, a fiery perspective on how Mennonites need to be angry against injustice and against violence, but uh, somewhat unsurprisingly, doesn't really offer solutions, is uncomfortable with power and with government, and most interestingly, makes no reference to the patron saint of neo-Anabaptist, John Howard Yoder, who of course is increasingly disgraced by ongoing new revelations of years and years of serial sexual abuse. So the Yoderite perspective uh, is promoted without mentioning the man himself. Yoder's most famous book was The Politics of Jesus. Melissa in her book references the politics of Mary. So perhaps that will be the replacement phrase for those who would like to let Yoder go unmentioned. Mark Levecki, Melissa's review or description of, or rather Deborah's review of Melissa's book was rather restrained, descriptive, not searingly critic critical. Presumably, Mark Levecki, had he reviewed this book, would have been more searingly critical. But uh, please share your thoughts. Yeah, Deborah, Deborah kept it in, kept it in, uh, in check. Uh, your, your critique is my critique. She, she offers, you know, the, the book that is reviewed offers apparently a, a fiery condemnation of uh, apparently power. Um, maybe with the caveat power that is used to oppress people, but it seems to me it's just a, a critique of power, which would be par for the course, uh, without offering any sort of solution. So she does the easy lifting, leaves the, the heavy lifting on the table. Uh, this concept of the Church of Yoder without Yoder is absolutely fascinating. Um, Yoder, I suppose, himself would come under her critique as somebody who used the power to oppress, and therefore he must be one of those people with whom we must be angrier. Uh, and to call our enemy. Um, on that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sort of happily sympathetic. Uh, her title could be the title of one of my books. I, I appreciate the title. As Deborah points out, she doesn't sort of hold true to it. She, it's it's not a how to. It's just a it's just a, a journey. Uh, just a just a complaint. Um, so the sentiment is right. This is my, you know my ongoing sort of frustration with this brand of Christianity is is they recognize deep in their soul that there are things you ought to be angry about. And then, and then it just sort of stops. And that, you know, that's not to say, you know, Howard Wass and Shane Claiborne or any of these guys aren't doing things to try to actively improve their world. Uh, but this particular book uh, seems to take it to an extreme to almost be uh, seemingly world denying. Um, I'm not sure that there's a place for her anger in this world. I don't know what constructive work it does. I don't know what redemptive work it does. It's just sort of, you know, uh, so that's frustrating. Um, you know, she, she, she makes the old distinctions between, you know, the old order and the new order. The old order is one of retribution. The new order is one of forgiveness. If that's the case, then where does Yoder fit into that paradigm? He seems to be the unforgiven. Um, if that seems to be against uh, you know, their their strategy. So I'm just left wondering why her book is getting so much more press than probably anything I will ever write. 
Well, uh, we lament that uh, her book will uh, sell much more than Mark Levecki's uh, brilliant latest book, but uh, we'll just leave that up to Providence to uh, work out for the long term. There it I'll is. share a brief uh, reflection on my interview with uh, Karen Tumalti of the Washington Post, her new book on Nancy Reagan, which relates to Providence themes in that uh, Nancy Reagan, his first lady, was tremendously influential on the presidency of her husband, especially as related to the Cold War and his moving towards a collaborative attitude uh, with Mikhail Gorbachev. And uh, up until the very end, there were many hardliners or some hardliners in the administration who resisted that move, uh, the summits with Gorbachev, the arms control treaties, uh, even though those summits and arms control treaties uh, reflected American ascendancy and ultimately American victory in the Cold War. But uh, it's sometimes it's hard to accept that you're winning. Sometimes it's easier from the human perspective to keep uh, grinding the ax and uh, presuming that the war must uh, continue because conflicts don't end naturally. But magnificently, that conflict uh, did end. And the most fascinating anecdote to me from her book is that uh, Tumulty uh, uniquely had access or gained access or found a letter that Reagan wrote uh, during his presidency to his dying uh, father-in-law, who was an atheist uh, and uh, very uh, unsettled as he lay in a hospital bed. And Reagan in a four- Oh, you're on pause. Ended up giving uh, the dying father-in-law a great peace and he summoned a hospital chaplain and uh, presumably was at peace with the Lord uh, when he left. Uh, that letter had never been discovered before, although Nancy, I recall from my youth, did describe it to a Christian youth convention here in DC towards the end of Reagan's presidency. So a fascinating book and a great interview uh, that I conducted with Karen Tumulty of the Washington Post that I commend to you. Let's hear from Mark Melton about a piece uh, just published on James Bond and the need for the Cold War, Mark. Right, so in this piece, Cutler writes about the uh, recent James Bond movie, but he's also going back and looking at some of the older movies and the trajectory of those movies, and as well as the original writings of Ian Fleming. And we should have another piece coming up in the next couple of weeks or so from Eric Patterson about James Bond that will look at the film in a different way. But in this particular article, the author describes the basically why James Bond needs to exist within the Cold War and specifically in the fight against the Soviet Union because in the Ian Fleming books the author grounds the conflict between this moral conflict between good and evil whereas in the movies at that time the Soviet Union is not mentioned or criticized very much it is Spectre that is the big enemy. In fact, sometimes later on, the Soviet Union is mentioned as, you know, there are bad actors, but like apparently the head, I haven't seen these movies, but the head of the organization was the, was more sympathetic and wanted peace. And so they were rogue agents. And so at the time during the Cold War, the movies did not dive into that conflict very much, whereas the original books did. And in the current Daniel Craig movies, I haven't seen the latest one, but the you know Daniel Craig is much more of a broody. Not it's more of almost a Dark Knight Rises type of character. And to me, I've I kind of enjoy that, but I also don't go to the movie to see any deep uh, deep conversation. Most I'm there to see the action. But Cutler mentions how Daniel Craig's presentation falls flat because he isn't really saying much. And he says in the end, if he had to choose between the broody Daniel Craig character or going back to, I can't remember which James Bond, he says basically going back to just flashy locales and fancy uh, you know, explosions and whatnot, he would rather go back to the less serious version if they're not going to actually engage with some type of moral conundrum. I confess as a boy and young man, uh, in the 1980s, uh, I disdain James Bond movies with Roger Moore because, and you allude to this, that uh, the enemy was always some absurd villain living underwater and such, and the Soviet Union was never referenced. So it all seemed like science fiction and mm -hmm. fantasy to me, but I can think I never actually read the books themselves. 
Yeah, I like the Daniel Craig one movies. Uh, I haven't seen the Roger Moore. I you know grew up with the Pierce Brosnan um, back in the '90s, and so I'm used to those. But the I like the broodier, honestly, a little bit more. But I also like the James Bo- or the the Born Identity series, and so that is. You know, he's, you know, you know, Jason Bourne, you know, is not a womanizer. He's fallen in love with one person and, you know, stays true to that and is, I, I, I like those movies a good bit. But I ha- I know you like uh, John LeCare, how you pronounce his name, Kari? John LeCare, yes, although he had his own moral uh, ambivalence in gray areas, but at least it was about the Cold War. And of course, as a, a young Methodist, I thoroughly disapprove Roger Moore's uh, promiscuity. It was very shocking. <laughs> Okay, Mark Levecki, uh, tell us about uh, your piece for World Magazine about the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, resignation in Afghanistan. Yeah, I jumped into the conversation about whether or not General Milley ought to have resigned following his Senate testimony, uh, in which he revealed that he gave seemingly rather explicit advice to President Biden about troop levels and maintaining certain assets in Afghanistan, such as modern military space. Uh, you know, the drawdown schedules, um, pulling uh, certain concessions from the Taliban in advance, a whole sort of plethora of things that apparently went almost to an item completely ignored by the Biden administration. And he was challenged by Senator Cotton um, as to why he didn't resign. And I actually think Milley's answer to Senator Cotton, uh, it was split, but one part of it was very reasonable. Um, in which he talked about the essentially the civil military relationship, the fact that we have a civilian led military, why that's important and why that should be maintained and that the president ought to be free not to take the advice of his senior military officials. And that were he to resign simply because the president didn't take his advice and some of this is reading into it, uh, but that would, that would suggest an undue kind of um, uh, in, uh, influence to try to get the president to change his mind, and then that would compromise civilian leadership. That answer I thought was, was pretty good. And so in the piece, I defend General Milley uh, in the beginning to suggest that I think he was right not to resign prior to the withdrawal. Uh, but following the withdrawal, the decision having been made, the catastrophe now being irreversible, his resignation would not in fact compromise uh, civilian control of the military, um, but rather like Mattis, uh, then Secretary Mattis resigned under the Trump administration and provided a letter uh, that was given to the public explaining his rationale. I thought Milley could do a service to the nation by resigning, by explaining the reasons for his resignation and helping to set that record straight. That's presuming that General Milley found uh, the Afghan withdrawal as catastrophically incompetent as most of the rest of us did. Uh, so that's that's essentially the piece that I wrote for World Magazine, trying to uh, argue both sides of it to a degree, but coming down in the end that you know it, it seems radically unjust that apparently nobody is going to be held to account for the disgraceful debacle that was the flight from Afghanistan. Well, and I should point out that uh, Mark and myself are both writing regularly now for World Magazine, uh, which we're honored to do. I've written two pieces so far, one on the moral and strategic imperative of U.S. uh, friendship with uh, Taiwan, and also the moral implications of uh, the restoration of full uh, Sharia law in Afghanistan, which sadly and tragically was uh, a choice made by many, if not most, of the Afghan people when they declined to resist the uh, Taliban takeover of their country. So look forward to future brilliant commentary from Mark Lebecki and myself in the pages and online with World Magazine. Gentlemen, thank you for this episode of Marxism. Until next week, bye-bye. Take care.